think we'll get started. So today we have the wonderful Dr. Shankari Rajagopal visiting us from Stanford. And she'll be telling us about using neutral atoms for quantum meteoro <laughs> metrology, not meteorology, <laughs> and simulation. Uh, so Shankari did her bachelor's in physics at MIT. She then went on to do her PhD at UC Santa Barbara. So we were actually in the same cohort in physics at, at UC Santa Barbara. And then she moved up to NorCal, uh, to Stanford, to start, to start a postdoc in a group there. Um, and she's also the recent recipient of a Stanford Science Fellowship, which is really a big, big deal. It'll fund an additional three years of her doing scientific research at Stanford. So it's pretty exciting. So with that, um, Dr. Raja Gopal. Hi, thank you so much for the lovely introduction, um, and thank you all for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, like Alex said, I am a postdoc. I work in the Schleyer Smith lab at Stanford University, and um, today I'm going to be talking about neutral atoms for quantum metrology and quantum simulation. And I thought maybe a good subtitle for my talk um, could be a quote from Ant-Man, if you've seen that, which is, do you guys just put the word quantum in front of everything? <laughs> it turns out, yeah, we kind of do. Um, before I dive into the actual substance of my talk, I want to provide you all with a reminder that today is March 2nd, and that means tomorrow is primary day in California. So please go vote. If now is the only time you have to do election research or to fill out a ballot, Please do that. I will not hold it against you. It's more important than what I'm going to tell you. All right. With that, I want to start by defining the two parts of my talk, quantum metrology and quantum simulation. Because I'm not going to lie, when I first heard the term quantum metrology, I thought it was using quantum technology to predict the weather. It turns out that metrology and meteorology are very different things. So metrology is simply the study of measurement. When I say quantum metrology, all I want you to think about is the study of precision measurement. And there's a problem here because if we want to measure something precisely, we need something really precise to do it with. If you want to measure something on the scale of millimeters, you can't do that with a ruler that's only marked with centimeters. It turns out that nature's provided us with an extremely precise ruler in the form of atoms. Atoms have extremely precise energies and are very uh, sensitive to forces. This means that we can use them to probe fundamental constants. Some of these constants we may just want to know to high precision, but other constants like the electron dipole moment, values that actually affect models in particle physics. So we can actually use our experimentally measured values to constrain potential dark matter candidates. Since um, atoms are also sensitive to forces, we can use them as inertial sensors. But perhaps most intriguingly, at least to me, if you've taken quantum mechanics, you know that energy and time are conjugate variables. They're related to each other. So this means that you can use atoms as very sensitive clocks. So th this aspect of quantum metrology is what I want to focus on today. We use atoms to define a second. And the reason we do that is that atoms have extremely well-known states that behave um, the same way every time, and they cycle between these states in a known way. Every cesium atom, for example, cycles between two states exactly 9,192,631,770 times a second. And this is our definition of a second. It's the time it takes for a cesium atom to do this. In the future in this talk, it takes a lot of effort and energy to say this whole number every time. I'm just going to refer to it as 9.2 gigahertz. But when I say 9.2 gigahertz, you know that this is actually the number that I mean. Now, we use cesium as our clock standard, but actually we're constantly pushing the limits of clock metrology forward all the time. The current best known clock actually exists at the University of Colorado in Boulder. It uses strontium atoms. And if you started that clock at the beginning of the known universe, and let it run all the way forward through to today, that clock would be off by 100 milliseconds. That is how precise these clocks are. It is insane, and it's really cool. But I think as a physicist, an important question to ask is not necessarily, is it cool? Although it's helpful if it's cool. <laughs> is it useful? If we want to spend a lot of our time and resources studying something, we want it to be useful to us in some way. 
So how do we see atomic clocks in our everyday lives? It turns out that our daily life is actually dependent on the existence of atomic clocks. The GPS that I followed to bring me here this morning um, actually depends on atomic clocks that are onboard satellites orbiting the Earth. We use atomic clocks in telecommunications applications, and actually in the last few years, people have started using them for high frequency stock trading. So there's actually something here for everybody. We're really dependent on atomic clocks. The other part of my, oh, yeah. So going back to the cesium uh, atom, would a temperature affect the number of cycles per second? The temperature, um, let's see. The temperature does slightly affect the, well, what it will actually affect is the fidelity with which you can control your two states. So yes, it will, if you have some variation in temperature, it will decrease the precision of that clock measurement. Yeah. Okay. And um, how big is the energy difference between the two states? It's 9.2 gigahertz, and I'll actually get to that a little bit later. Okay. It's H bar, or Planck's constant times 9.2 gigahertz. The other part of my talk is quantum simulation. And simulation is something we're all kind of familiar with, right? Whether it's because we've read an Arthur C. Clarke novel or we've played The Sims. A simulation is just one system imitating another. So quantum simulation is just using something to imitate a quantum system. What sorts of quantum systems might we want to simulate? Well, it turns out that there are materials that are really hard to study and that we don't understand particularly well. So if you think about any material in your everyday life, the properties of that material are determined by how electrons move in some kind of crystal lattice in that material. And those electrons' behavior is governed by quantum mechanics. Now, there's lots of materials that we understand really well, but there are some that we don't. For example, the mechanism behind why certain materials superconduct at high temperatures is not well understood right now. And if we could understand it, if material scientists could figure out how to fabricate those materials and incorporate them into electronics, that would make our technology a lot more efficient because they would lose a lot less power than the semiconductors that we're using right now. So you might say, okay, why don't we just study high temperature superconducting materials themselves. We have these solid materials, let's just study them. And that's, we can learn a lot by doing that. But that also has its limits because there's very few things that you can tune about a material, about a solid material, to learn about its properties. If you have a solid, you can change its temperature, you can change its pressure, you can maybe change the doping, but you can't fundamentally alter that solid material in any meaningful way. This is where the idea of quantum simulation comes in. You need one quantum system in order to simulate another. And I can't put it any better than the great Richard Feynman. This is a direct quote. Nature isn't classical, damn it. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you better make it quantum mechanical. And by golly, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy. <laughs> um, and that's very true. It's not easy, but it's so much fun. So what we are actually going to do is use atoms in optical lattices. By optical lattices, what I mean are just standing waves of laser light that are going to create some lattice potential. If we cool down our atoms until they're really cold, sort of near absolute zero, they're going to act in a quantum way, and their behavior in optical lattices is going to be the same as electrons in crystal lattices. But now our atomic system is tunable. Since our lattices are made of light, we can change the wavelength of that light, we can change the power, um, we can actually even tune how much our atoms interact with each other, which is not something you can typically do with electrons. So this is a really powerful method for studying and simulating interesting materials. And the number of interesting materials is really vast. The one that I want to focus on towards the end of my talk today is magnetic models, or how we can use spins to simulate different magnetic phases. So with that, this is sort of an outline of the rest of my talk. I'll be talking about atomic clocks, how they work and what limits them, how we can engineer an atomic system that helps us overcome some of these limits using a tool called Rydberg atoms, and finally at the end, how we can use these same atomic systems as models for magnetic materials. So first, atomic clocks. When I say atomic, 
You might be thinking, well, which atom, right? There's tons of them. There's a periodic table full of them. So what we're going to actually be talking about specifically is cesium. Cesium lives all the way over here in group one of the periodic table. This means it has one valence electron. All of these group one elements, um, I don't know if you've ever had the fortune or misfortune to see this, uh, this kind of reaction in person, but they're highly flammable if you <laughs> put them in water. <laughs> kind of fun to see from a distance. Um, so actually, the fact that we want to work with these group one atoms is because they only have one valence electron, so they're extremely easy to cool and trap. The electronic structure is a lot simpler for the group one atoms. Additionally, the heavier you go, the larger the energy difference between relevant states. And so this makes it a lot easier to sort of detect and resolve what state your atom is in at any given time. So this is why we really like cesium. The other reason we like cesium is because all of the laser wavelengths we use to cool and trap these atoms are commercially available. So what we are actually going to be doing is manipulating different internal states of the atoms. Atomic states have discrete energy levels. They're quantized. That's where quantum mechanics comes from. We're actually going to focus on two specific internal atomic states of cesium. If you're familiar with quantum mechanics, these are the actual states that we care about here. They're hyperfine states, that's what these Fs mean. And they arise because of mixing between the nuclear spin and the electronic spin of cesium. If you're not familiar with quantum mechanics, don't worry about it. We're actually just going to think of these states as being up and down. And these are both long-lived ground states of the cesium atom. The up and the down states are separated by an energy of Planck's constant times 9.2 gigahertz. And when I say 9.2 gigahertz, you know what number I actually mean. Uh, what's that in electron volt? What is that in electron volt? Well, what's it in some other unit? Uh, in in some energy. other unit? Um, if you don't know, it's okay. Oh, uh, it's sort of microwaves. Yeah, microwave regime. Microwave. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so we have these states, we have some energy splitting, and what we want to do is sort of pull them out of abstract quantum world and begin to visualize what is actually going on with this atom. And there's actually a very popular and easy way to do that. It's called the block sphere. So this sphere is going to re represent possible states of our atom when we've simplified it to just this two-state system of up and down. So a vector pointing along the positive z direction is going to represent the up state, and the negative z direction is going to represent the down state. But because our atoms are quantum, we can have these atoms exist in superpositions of these two states at the same time. So the block sphere is actually the set of all possible unique superposition states that this two-level atom can exist in. So for example, if we have this atom pointing in the x direction, and we go and measure the, the z spin of the atom, the x spin is actually an equal superposition of the up state and the down state. And so when we measure it, we'll get half a, probab a probability of measuring up half the time and down half the time. Now we have really great control over what state our atom is in. So imagine you have some atomic cloud and all of those atoms are in the down state somehow. We want to put them in the up state. Well, we know exactly what the energy splitting is. It's H times 9.2 gigahertz. And 9.2 gigahertz are microwaves. That's um, sort of the regime that those waves are in. And it turns out that if you go on eBay or any supplier, you can get microwave electronics cheaply and readily. So we have a bunch of these electronics in our lab. And if we set it at the right frequency and shoot these microwaves at our atoms, what we can actually do is drive our atoms into the up state and back to the down state. And as long as we keep our microwaves on, our atoms are just going to keep cycling between these two states. We can also stop our microwaves at any point, and we've initialized the atom in some superposition. So really nice control here. This is some data that we actually took in lab doing exactly this measurement. So here at time zero, 
we've started with all of our atoms in the down state. And as a function of how long we apply our microwave pulses for, you can see that our atoms oscillate back and forth between up and down. A really neat fact about this sort of measurement, oscillating between two states, is that if you take this measurement and do it out to a really long time, you will actually see that the amplitude of the sinusoid will decay as an exponential. And that decay tells you what the coherence of your system is. So if you ever you know, read a science article or something and it talks about the coherence of a system, whether it's for nitrogen vacancies, nuclear magnetic resonances, um, qubits and quantum computers, all they've done to measure that coherence is looked at some two-state oscillation up to a long period of time. We're actually not so interested in the coherence of this system. Um, it's much longer than we need it to be. But what we do want to do is extract this clock frequency somehow. The way that we're going to do that is we're going to start with many atoms in a superposition along the x direction, half up, half down. This state is then going to rotate at a rate proportional to the energy difference between up and down. And an intuitive way to see this is if you write out the wave function as a superposition of up and down, you can write unitary time evolution operators for each state. And those time evolution operators are going to be a function of those states' energies. So you'll get some evolution in time, which will actually look like just a rotation of the state around the equator of your block sphere. Our clock wants to basically measure this rotation rate. The problem is that if we go to directly measure this spin at any point along the equator, we're going to measure up half the time and down half the time, no matter where we are. We can't get any phase information out of that. Instead, what we need to do is rotate this state around the x-axis, and that projects this phase onto a difference in atom number between up and down. So our superposition state is going to change based on what that phase was. This is really, really powerful because now simply measuring the populations of atoms in up versus down gives us information about that phase of the rotating spin. And by doing multiple of these phase measurements at different times, we can extract information about the rotation rate and measure the clock frequency. Yeah. So how do you know you were rotating about the x axis versus some other axis. Right. Yeah, that's a great question. You can just do it by controlling the phase of the microwave pulses that you should hit the atoms with. So you need extremely good phase control for your electrons. Yeah, um, yeah. OK. So this is great. We can say atoms are great. They're great clocks. Um, we're going to use them for all measurements ever. Um, but the problem is we actually can't, because there's always a catch. And the catch with quantum mechanics usually comes in the form of uncertainties. So I kind of offhand uh, mentioned that we need to measure the atom number in up versus down, right? But quantum mechanics is not deterministic. Measurement is actually probabilistic. So if you wanted to measure this state, what you'd have to do is a bunch of repeated measurements to see that you got up half the time and down half the time. If you want to measure this state, you do a bunch of measurements and see that you got up slightly more times. It's like flipping a coin and flipping a loaded coin. So, I, may I? I just I, I need to get caught up on this. The middle of the middle one, the uh, middle image there. Yeah. What is what is defining that your that your rotation is is a, about the z axis? So so, I mean I, I was just thinking. So I, I I've got this. You're telling me, and I can imagine the wave function having a term that's dependent on energy, so I'm, I'm following that. But I'm having a difficulty knowing what about your experimental setup or the mental model I should have in it that I know that I start off um, moving in the XY plane only. Yeah, it's just conservation of energy, actually. So if you initialize a state that's an equal superposition of up and down, if you end up in a state that has a different fraction in up or down, that will not conserve energy. So as long as you're just letting this state evolve without adding any energy to it, it's going to stay on. The yeah, that's there. exactly what I was looking for. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. Great. OK. So we have this problem of measurement and certainty that we have to deal with now. Because quantum mechanics in measurement, mechanical measurements are probabilistic. 
So in order to measure the fraction of atoms and up, you have to take a bunch of repeated measurements and look at the distribution. And you can maybe say, OK, I know the fraction of atoms and up by looking at the center of this distribution. But anytime you have a distribution, that's putting error bars on your measurement. right? And error is not something we like in precision measurement. We're trying to tamp down our error bars as much as possible to make things as precise as we can. So how can we minimize statistical uncertainty in our clock measurement? Well, one thing we can do is increase the atom number. If we have a bunch of different <coughs> copies of our system that increases our statistics, it's like doing a bunch of these measurements at the same time. We can also just increase the number of measurements that we do. But we can maybe think about whether there's a way to also make this distribution narrower. It turns out that for measurement uncertainty, in the lab, increasing the atom number is not a problem. In our experiments, we work with thousands of atoms at a time, so our statistics for measurement are great. But there's another type of uncertainty that I haven't mentioned yet, which is extremely fundamental to quantum mechanics that we do still have to worry about. So far, I've been drawing our states on the block sphere as being arrows pointed in a particular direction. But this quantum mechanical uncertainty means that we can't actually do that. What we have is a probability distribution of where that spin might actually be pointing. So you can think about this as if I have a bunch of spins that collectively point along x, there's actually going to be some distribution of atoms pointed along x or kind of slightly off of it. This uncertainty is Heisenberg uncertainty. So you might have heard of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which says that you can't know the momentum and the position of a particle precisely at the same time. It turns out Heisenberg uncertainty is very general, and it depends strongly on the system that you're working with. In this system, there is an uncertainty relationship between the y spin and the, and the z spin. So you can't actually know both the z and the y spin components at the same time. But what do we actually care about here? We're measuring the z spin, right? We're measuring the fractions of atoms in up or down. We don't actually care about y. Nobody cares about spin y. So let's see, say what, we could generate a state that looks like this instead. What if we squeezed our uncertainty distribution? So this, if you multiply the uncertainty in y here by the uncertainty in z, you're not violating the Heisenberg uncertainty relation. But you've given up some certainty in y to gain it in z, and z is all we care about. So effectively, by doing this, we've made this distribution narrower because z is what we're measuring. Great. If you're narrowing the distribution um, along z, do you, you widen it along x and y. Is that right? Um, so or, in this case, um, the length of the width in x is the length of your spin vector. Oh, yes. So as long as you conserve the same number of spins, that will not increase. But so y will. Perhaps I mean, if you, you you expand it equatorially, but you shrink it down through the other axis. Yes. And yes. Is there some sort of relationship between the area on the sphere? Yeah. From yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you can think about the Heisenberg uncertainty relationship as effectively <coughs> being the area on a sphere. So, yeah, it's always going to be greater than or equal to h bar over 2. No matter how much you shrink it in one direction, it will sort of expand in the other direction. So there's a fundamental limit there as well. Yeah. So this is, uh, in, in optics, is called squeezed light or, or something where you're picking which, which of these that you care about. Is this the same language or are you even doing it with light? And I mean, you're, you're doing with these two states, so. Yes, precisely. We are generating a, what's called a squeezed atomic state. So it turns out that to go from a state that looks like this to a state that looks like this, what we actually need is to correlate the behavior of all of our atoms. So instead of being independent from each other, we're going to say, OK, the behavior of our atoms is going to depend on all of their neighbors. And this correlated behavior is what can give us a squeezed state like this. So we need these correlations in our atomic behavior. How do we generate that? Well, we need to make our atoms interacting. So I would like you guys to do a little bit of a thought experiment with me. This thought experiment is called, you are an interacting spin. So 
For a second, I would like you to imagine that you are a spin, and you could be maybe either a spin up or a spin down. You have a magnetic dipole moment. That means that as a spin, you are creating your own little magnetic field around you, and so is each one of your neighbors. Now, you're, because you are interacting, you're close enough to interact, you feel the magnetic fields from all of your neighbors. So say as a spin you exist and you have a bunch of neighbors and half of them are in spin up, creating magnetic fields that point up, half of them are in spin down, so they're creating magnetic fields that point down. The average magnetic field that you feel is zero. All of the fields of your neighbors are canceling each other out, right? But now, what happens if that's not true? What happens if they're not even? Say you're surrounded by way more upspins than you are downspins. Then you're going to actually feel some average magnetic field, and it's going to point in the up direction. As a spin, what do you want to do more than anything when you're in a magnetic field? You want to larm or process. Everyone say, larm or process. So, um, Larm or precession, yeah. So any spin in a magnetic field will want to rotate around that magnetic field. Yes. So it turns out that if you are surrounded by more up atoms than down atoms, you're going to spin in one direction. If you're surrounded by more down atoms than up atoms, you'll spin in the other direction. So now imagine that you have all of these states on the block sphere. And each of these states on the meridian represents different fractions of spin-ups versus spin-downs. This state up here is way more spin-up than spin-down, so it's going to have a really strong average magnetic field, and it's going to rotate fast. Down here, it's going to have a much weaker magnetic field, and it's going to rotate more slowly. And down here, it's going to, offer, it's going to do the same thing, but in the opposite direction. So what you're going to get are dynamics that look like this, you let these states interact with each other and evolve in time. So this is exactly what we need for squeezing. Because if we start with a state that's pointing out of the board um, along the x-axis here, any atoms that are slightly deviating from that x-axis are going to start to rotate. And so what you actually get is a shearing of your uncertainty distribution. And this gives you exactly the squeezing that you want. So it turns out the only ingredient that we really need to generate this squeezing is interactions. So how do we actually engineer an atomic quantum system that lets us do this? How do we engineer interactions? Well, let's start at the very beginning with neutral atoms, right? Actually, not even neutral atoms. Let's say neutral atoms singular. You have some neutral atom by its lonesome, and it's hanging out, and suddenly it feels an electric field. Your atom is some negatively charged cloud surrounded, that surrounds a positively charged nucleus, right? So your electric field is going to induce a dipole moment in that atom. It's going to separate your positive and, nuclear, and, and negative charges slightly. We're going to define a quantity called the polarizability. And this term is going to represent the strength of dipoles that are created in that electric field. So if your electron is very tightly bound to your nucleus, maybe your electric field can't pull them apart so far. So that's going to have a really small dipole moment. But if your electron is more loosely bound, you can pull the charges apart a little bit more. Your dipole is going to get bigger. Now, we can also say that the electric field is going to change your atomic energy levels in a way that's proportional to the polarizability. And you can see this simply from something that you may have learned in ENM which is that the energy of a dipole in, a mag in an electric field goes as negative d dot e. So now let's increase our complexity by a factor of two. So you have two atoms. If one of these atoms is polarized, it creates its own little electric field, and that's going to polarize a nearby atom. But now these two charged, slightly charged atoms can attract each other. This interaction is actually called the van der Waals interaction, and it's exactly what lets geckos climb up trees. So, you know, next time you see a gecko out in the Sonoma Wilds or whatever, you can think about that. <laughs> um, so, okay, now let's think about what the energies of these atoms are doing, and specifically as a function of the distance between them. If these two atoms are really far apart, they're not interacting with each other at all. So your energy is simply the sum of each of the single atom energies. 
But as you move these atoms closer together, you're actually going to, it's going to start being energetically favorable. These atoms are going to attract each other and want to attract each other more and more. An alternate way you can think about this is that the electric field from each of these atoms is being felt by the other atom. And so each of those atoms' energies are getting shifted down. So the total energy is also getting shifted down. So in general, the shift in energy will depend on the strength of the dipole moment and the distance between atoms. For ground state atoms, the distance at which atoms start to interact with each other is tiny. It's actually angstroms to nanometers. So that's 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus 9 meters. Very short distances. If you want to control these interactions, have you ever tried taking two objects and holding them an angstrom away from each other in a controlled way? It's really, really hard. What we can actually do with our laser beams is control the atomic distances down to about the micron level. Um, it's also hard, but it is possible. So what we would really like to do is extend the range of our interactions out to the micron scale instead of the nanometer or angstrom scale. There's actually a pretty straightforward way to do this, and it's using something called Rydberg atoms. So these are atoms with highly excited outer electrons, a large n quantum number. Ground state atoms typically have an n for about, from about 2 to 8. I'm talking n's from 30 up to 120. These electrons are really, really excited, and their radius around the nucleus, uh, sorry, the radius of their orbit around the nucleus is really big. It turns out that the polarizability of these atoms goes as n to the 7. So the dipole moments for these Rydberg atoms is huge. The electron cloud size also goes as n squared. So if you have a ground state atom that has an electron cloud size this big, which you may or may not be able to see, the, the, an n equals 43 Rydberg atom looks like this. It's really, really big by comparison. Instead of being sort of angstrom size, these ones are 0.1 to 0.2 micron size, really big atoms. So between this and their huge dipole moments, if you look at the interactions, you can get them interacting on a critical radius of about two microns, actually anywhere from one to five microns, depending on which state you use. This means that if we have two Rydberg atoms, and we're controlling how far they're spaced away from each other on the micron scale, we can turn on interactions between them and know that they will interact because of the range of these interactions. Now, this sounds like an ideal solution, but there's actually also a problem with using Rydberg states. And it's that they're not very long lived. So in our experiments, they usually last for about 10 to 100 milliseconds. And we would really like our atoms to be interacting with each other on that kind of scale. But, yeah. So they're not cesium? They're, are, are they still in group one? They are, oh, that's a great question. These are still cesium atoms. This is just describing the state that the electron is excited to. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so um, it turns out that if you excite an, a, an atom, a cesium atom, up to this Rydberg state, it will fall back down to its ground state within about 10 microseconds. Not a very long lifetime at all. So instead, there's a really neat trick we can play to extend the lifetime. Instead of exciting an atom from, say, the up state all the way up to directly a Rydberg state, we're going to put our atoms in a superposition of Rydberg and up. And it's not going to be an equal superposition. It's going to be mostly the up state, which is the ground state, mixed with a tiny, 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 tiny little bit of the Rydberg state. And that's something that we can control using our excitation laser. Because the dipole moment of the Rydberg state is so large, that tiny fraction of mixing in Rydberg states is all we need to get long-range interactions. But because our atoms are actually mostly in the up state, which is a ground state, they're much, they have much longer lifetimes. I'm not actually going to get into how you get these sort of energy profiles, but in comparison to two Rydberg atoms, these Rydberg dressed states, these superpositions, have sort of a different energy profile as a function of distance. But you can see that at some critical distance, they do start to interact with each other. And this is on the scale of microns. 
Yeah. Can, I, can I think of this um, back to the uncertainty principle? We've got the delta E being very large. That's what's driving delta T very small for the, the lifetimes of these states. I was just trying to th think that through. You know, mm -hmm. I was, first I was thinking of the delta energies being very small because of all the levels, but I think we need to compare to the, the ground state. So delta E is very large, so delta T is small, and we have short lifetimes. And, but I'm, 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 I'm trying to see how I can build this up to have this be a long lifetime. Maybe we can talk about it afterwards, but, but I'm, I'm trying to follow. And, I, and, and so you, you build up, just first, is that a car cartoon model just using uncertainty to set, set lifetimes for these states reasonable? So it, you can think about it that way, but it's not the energy I think that you're thinking of. So the energy that matters is actually the sort of width of energies that you can use to drive the transition between the down state and the up state. Mm -hmm. It has to be extremely precise. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so that's the sort of energy that you think about um, for like sort of a lifetime. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. On the hyperfine right? or like the width of the. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, for Rydberg lifetimes, you can typically you can also sort of think of it as like um, the width of energies that you can use to drive an atom up to the Rydberg state is quite large, and so the lifetime of that state gets quite small. Um, and by what's actually called detuning this laser frequency, so making it farther away from resonance, mm -hmm. um, you can control very finely how much of the Rydberg state you're actually mixing into. No, I, I, I think I, yeah, exactly, yeah. okay. I see, thank you. Okay, cool. So one thing you might note is um, this energy profile looks like an attractive potential. By changing different parameters of our excitation laser, we can actually make this repulsive if we want, so we can change the sign of our interactions. We can also change the range of our interactions and the strength. So this is really powerful control over our interactions. And note that if we just switch our Rydberg laser off entirely, our atoms stop interacting with each other as well. Now, one thing that you might note is that if you have two of these Rydberg rest atoms interacting with each other, so sort of within this distance scale, there's going to be an energy shift, right? Before, what we were doing with a clock frequency is measuring, the, measuring that rotation rate due to the energy difference between the down state and the up state. Here, I'm only coupling the up state to the Rydberg laser. So its energy is going to change slightly. It's going to shift down. But the down state energy is unaffected. What that means is that these interactions are actually going to change our rotation rate. So. That we, our rotation rate is actually going to depend on the number of atoms in the up state. The more interactions we have, the faster that state is going to rotate because the larger the energy shift is. So this gives us exactly what we want for squeezing. Um, the rotation rate is going to depend on the number of atoms in up. And this is a sort of general property called one axis twisting. Um, this is work that's been sort of pioneered by several groups around the world, um, and it's um, something that we've started looking into experimentally now, which is very exciting. So this is sort of our goal. We're going to demonstrate these one-axis twisting interactions in a context that's relevant for atomic clocks. So if you step into our lab, this is sort of what you will find. You will find two 5 by 10 foot tables that are filled with lasers and optics, and you'll find a third table that has a giant vacuum chamber on it. All of our lasers are used to generate the light that we send into the, uh, to this chamber to control and cool and trap our atoms. So if you are um, thinking about doing undergraduate research or any kind of research in a lab like this, um, we get to do all of the laser work ourselves, we get to build the optical systems, we get to design this, we get to build a lot of it ourselves, so do machining. Uh, we get to build and design all of the electronics that we use to control our experiments. If you like doing things with your hands and being hands-on in the lab, this is a great kind of lab to work in to gain all kinds of fun skills. <coughs> right, okay, so it's kind of hard from these pictures to see exactly what's going on. So here's a schematic. This entire thing is under vacuum, and our cesium lives in a little metal cup down here.
And it, we load it as a metal, but it turns into a gas at room temperature. We actually cool that gas down from room temperature down to a millikelvin, so already very cold, very close to absolute zero, using these two cooling stages called a 2D and a 3D magneto-optical trap. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about um, what those are, but I'm happy to answer questions about them. So by the time they're sitting trapped in the middle of this chamber at a millikelvin, or actually we do further cooling down to 20 microkelvin, we have really good control over them. So we load them into what's called an optical dipole trap. It's a really intensely focused laser beam. Um, it's a, the same as an optical tweezer, if you've ever heard of that. And the, we moved the, move these trapped atoms from the center of this chamber to the center of this chamber. This is called our science chamber. It's where all of our science happens. Um, this is where we shoot the Rydberg laser in to make some of our atoms interact. And this is also where we take pictures of our atoms because we have to be able to get data out of this behemoth somehow. Actually, it's pretty easy to take pictures of atoms, it turns out. So, so far, we've been sort of thinking about our atom as having these two ground states down and up, maybe some excited Rydberg state, but it turns out that there are lots of interesting intermediate states. So if you have atoms that are in the up state, you can use laser light to excite them up to one of these intermediate states. They're going to absorb this light. And then they're going to fall back to the ground state and emit that light. All we have to do is collect all of those emitted photons to take a picture of our atoms. So that looks something like this. This is an elongated cloud because we've moved these atoms in a sort of a one-dimensional trap. So um, I guess one thing I should say about this imaging process is these atoms are actually gaining a lot of energy when they're absorbing and emitting these photons. So this is destructive. As soon as we take a picture of this, these atoms are gone. But we've only taken a picture of the up atoms. We still have a bunch in the down state that don't see this imaging light because there's no transition for them to turn to. So then we can move our up, down atoms to the up state and image them the same way. And that way we can get a simultaneous reading of the atoms that were in the down state. Now when we turn our Rydberg laser on, we can very clearly see the region in which our, um, the Rydberg light is hitting our atoms. And what we know is that only the atoms in this region, there are atoms there, I promise, um, are interacting with each other. None of these atoms out here are interacting with each other. And this is really nice because it gets rid of any systematics for us. If we compare the rotation rates in an interacting region versus a non-interacting region, we know that any differences are just going to come from the interactions. So how do we actually measure the strength of those interactions? It's the exact same way we measure our clock frequency. So we're going to start with atoms in a superposition of up and down. It might be equal, it might not be. Um, and then those states are going to rotate at a rate proportional to the energy difference due to the interactions when we turn our interactions on. And then at the end of some evolution period with interactions, we're going to rotate around the x-axis to convert the phase to a population difference. And then we can simply measure the, state, the atoms in up or down. So let's just do this experiment. So this is actually data that I'm showing you at this point. What we're going to do is prepare a bunch of initial states with some initial microwave pulse. And each of these states is going to represent a different fraction of up atoms versus down atoms. Then we're going to turn on our interactions and let each of these states evolve and see what happens. So these are experimental data points. And this is how we see each of those states behaving. So if I plot all of those points on one thing, what we actually see is that for a bunch of different of these tilts that represent different fractions of up and down, you can actually see that the interactions makes these states twist. And if we can plot that as a function of the actual amount that each state twists to see that we actually do get this squeezing effect. What this means is that whatever this state is right here, this state that points along the x-axis, this state should actually be squeezed at this point. Now, you have to take a bunch of measurements that are quite different from this to actually prove that you've created a squeezed state. 
And that's not something that we've been able to measure yet, but it's sort of our next immediate experimental goal. But this sort of shows that we have all of the ingredients that we need to generate those states. So briefly now, I kind of want to take a quick step back because we have this really cool interacting atomic system. We can measure a bunch of atoms in different states and we can actually use these atoms as models for magnetic materials. Um, this I'm going to talk about in the context of something that's really near and dear to my heart, which is that twisting interactions are a stepping stone to spin phases. So when you think about a phase, you might think about a gas or a liquid or a solid, right? And each of those phases can transition from one to the other as a function of maybe some thermodynamic variable, right? A pressure change or a temperature change or something like that. But a phase is much more general. A phase is sort of anything that has uniform properties in a bulk sense. So it turns out that magnets actually have phases of their own. So some of the ones that you can think about or that you might have experience with are if you, all of your spins in a magnet are interacting with each other, they might all want to align with each other. They might all want to be in a spin up state or all in a spin down state. Or if they have a different type of interaction, they might want to alternate. That's an antiferromagnetic state. If you put a bunch of spins, if you put a magnet in a really strong electric field, eventually all those spins are going to want to align along that field. That's called a paramagnet. These are all different phases of magnetic models and magnetic materials. And so this is where quantum simulation comes in, because we can use our spins as a, sim as a quantum simulator for these magnetic materials. Okay, so what these up-up interactions actually represent are something called Ising interactions. And so here I've written the Hamiltonian, the total energy, for something called the Ising model. These sigmas are called Pauli operators. They're actually Pauli Z operators in this case. And each of them represents a spin. What I want you to think about is if this operator acts on an atom, it's going to return, it's like a function, it's going to return what the z state of that atom is. So if it acts on a spin up, it might return a plus one. If it acts on a spin down, it might return a minus one. So for neighboring atoms, i and j, this product of these Pauli operators is going to return a minus one if our atoms are aligned in different directions and a plus one if they're both aligned in the same direction. J here simply represents the strength of the interactions. So this Hamiltonian, this energy operator, represents the total energy of all of the interacting spins in a system. We can let I and J include all of our spins. Now, if J happens to be negative, it's going to be energetically favorable for our atoms to align all up or all down. They're all going to be along plus or minus z. These are called ferromagnetic interactions. These are, there's no energy difference between all up and all down. So they're both ground states. These are both stable fixed points of a ferromagnetic system. If J happens to be positive, those are antiferromagnetic interactions and it's going to be energetically favorable for your atoms to anti-align. You can actually use antiferromagnetic interactions for a bunch of really, really cool physical systems. We haven't done it yet, so I'm just going to ignore it for now. But what I am going to do is complicate our Hamiltonian a little bit more. So what I'm going to do is add a transverse field. This is an external magnetic field that's going to point in the x direction now. So if H is zero and you have interactions, you're going to have, a, if you have J less than zero, you still have these ferromagnetic interactions and you still have two ground states, all up or all down. But say you have no interactions or your interactions are very weak compared to your external field. All of your atoms are now going to want to align along that field. That is a single ground state. It's a paramagnet. So by changing the interplay between the interaction strength and the external field strength, you can undergo a phase transition from a single ground state, a paramagnetic state, to a ferromagnetic state. This is a very famous model. It's called the transverse field Ising model. And it's actually one of the simplest canonical models 
for looking at a quantum phase transition. Um, so it's, there's lots and lots of great literature on it if you want to read about it. So what do these two cases actually look like for our spins? Well, if our external field is zero, we just have interactions. That means we just get twisting dynamics. So if we start along the meridian, you're going to get rotations depending on how many up atoms you have. Stable points or ground states here are going to be the states that don't evolve in time. They're stable where they are. They want to stay there. So here you can see that there are two stable fixed points at the poles. Those represent all up or all down. That's great. That's what we thought it should be. You can see this other fixed point here. That is a fixed point, but it's unstable. Any small deviations away from the state are going to result in something that's going to start rotating. In the other case, if you have very weak interactions or no interactions, but a strong external field, you can start with all of your spins along the meridian, but this is an X field. The direction of this field is pointed out of the board or into the board, depending. Um, actually, in this case, I think it's into the board. So if you're a spin in a magnetic field, what do you want to do? Yeah, yes, you want a lot more process. So all you're going to get is rotations of each of these states around that magnetic field. This is just Larmor precession. So now we can ask, these are sort of two extremes. What happens when these two things try to fight with each other? What if your interactions are about as strong as your external field? This is a great place where we can use quantum simulation to help us because we already have interactions that we can tune. All we need to do is add an external magnetic field we should be able to realize the transverse field Ising model and maybe try to observe a signature of this paramagnet to ferromagnetic phase transition. So that's what we do. This is all data. These images are kind of a lot, so we'll walk through them. Um, the blue lines here are actually theoretical predictions. So if you start at any point along the block sphere, under the certain interaction strengths and fields that we have in the lab, these are how we predict those states are going to evolve. All the way to the left here, this is the case where we have no interactions at all. That's that external magnetic field along X, which is still going into the board right now. So all of the colored dots are data. The squares represent our initial states. And all of the other little dots represent how they evolve in time. And in the case with no interactions, you can actually see that we just see rotation. So that's exactly what we expected. As we slowly turn up the interaction strength, we see that we can go from having one fixed point to an immediate bifurcation of two different fixed points. Those fixed points move higher and higher and higher on the block sphere. They move towards the poles. So this shows that we are undergoing a phase transition here between a paramagnetic phase and a ferromagnetic phase with these two all up or all down ground states. So this is something that we're really excited about being able to see. So what's next for us? Well, from a metrological standpoint, I mentioned we still haven't explicitly demonstrated squeezing, and that's something that we want to do very soon. Once we do that, we can try to figure out how to optimize it. How do we make a maximally squeezed state? How do we make it better? We can do that by changing how we turn on our interactions, or maybe using a transverse field to get us to a better squeezed state. And if we can do this, we can then create multiple ensembles of these squeezed states. If we have a bunch of copies of the same system, that means our statistics go up and our sensitivity goes up. So we can try to make a really precise plot this way. From a quantum simulation standpoint, what we're really interested in is many body physics. So what happens when you have a bunch of quantum particles that interact with each other? Some of these are lattice spin models. So you could have spins on a bunch of different lattice sites. And if you allow them to have Ising interactions with each other, you can look at what the ground states of these models are in one, two, or three dimensions. You can also have Heisenberg interactions, where you, if you have an up, state, up spin next to a down, they can actually flip with each other. And so you can ask, what are the ground states of that model? If you have Heisenberg interactions that are anti-ferromagnetic, on a honeycomb lattice, which is a bunch of patterned hexagons. So you can see we can make this as complicated as we want to. That system is actually supposed to exhibit physics related to high temperature superconductors. 
So it's a little bit complicated, but it's kind of, it feels like it's within distance. And the other thing that we're really interested in is actually time crystals. So these are structures that are periodic in time. At every set interval, it's always going to return to the same state. And then you can add noise to this system and say, OK, well, this noise should disturb these dynamics. It's not going to return to the same state every time. But it turns out if you add interactions, you can restore that periodicity, which is really interesting. So that's all the stuff we're really excited about in the future. But for now, the stuff that we talked about were how atomic clocks work. We talked about how they're precision limited by statistics of uncorrelated atoms and how we can introduce interactions to overcome that. We talked about how to create these interactions using Rydberg dressing. We used these interactions to demonstrate one axis twisting and create, to create what's potentially a squeezed state. And we also used this same model, the same experimental setup, to observe dynamical signatures of the paramagnetic to ferromagnetic phase transition in a transverse field Ising model. So there's lots of really exciting stuff coming up. With that, I have some people that I need to thank. Uh, my professor, Monica Schleiersmith, is incredible. Um, the three graduate students pictured here, Tori, Augie, and Jacob, actually built this lab up from scratch. It was an empty lab. They designed the experiment and built it up from, from scratch. They're wonderful. There's lots of other graduate students in the lab working on other experiments. And we've actually had tons of undergraduates come through who have made really relevant and lasting impacts on our research. Um, so, you know, undergraduates really matter to us and we appreciate the work that they do. Um, yeah, and with that, I'd like to thank our funding agencies as well for their money and you <laughs> for all of your time. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions.